we continue with the introduction to the word. Abiding spirit, may our hearts be open to the mystery of the gospel. That the creator of this life may be known to all. Amen. The reading is from the book of James, chapter 1, beginning with the 17th verse. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any who are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they are like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Here ends the reading. Our God is the source of wisdom and understanding. Bless us with your gifts, O God. Our God feeds us with the bread of life and the wellspring of our salvation. Bless us with your grace, Christ Jesus. Our God is the foundation of mercy and compassion. Bless us with your gifts, mighty spirit. Why are you here? Why did you come to worship today? Why did you uh, decide to click that link and follow uh, the link and watch this video of a worship. What made you volunteer, voluntarily choose to spend one of the last summer Sundays before Labor Day at a church service? I mean, why aren't you lolling around on some beach? Well, actually, maybe you are when you watch this. Or maybe you're going to do it later today. Maybe you're here out of habit. Maybe going to church is what you do. Uh, maybe you're here because your parents dragged you kicking and screaming and you would rather be somewhere else. Maybe you're here because you're lonely, you're in pain, you're suffering, you're grieving. Maybe you're here because you feel that something is not going right in your life. Maybe you're here hoping that being here, spending some time here with us will make a difference here. Now, None of these really are bad reasons to be with us today, not even if your parents brought you. But here's the reason we gather as Christians for worship week after week. We worship to wake up. We worship to come alive, uh, to take notice of the presence and the power of God in the world and in our lives. We, we, we come here to wake up to where God is and realize that God is all over and what we hear and see and touch. In Latin, re, re ligare, it's the word that we get religion from, has the root lig. Some scholars have traced the meaning of that partially back to mean to pay attention. Any religious service, any religious act should make us sit up and become alert, should make us clear our heads, should make us focus on the presence of the divine. When our lives adhere to a set schedule, 
when every, uh, everyday routines can be acted out as if we're really, really not even thinking about them, we lose consciousness to the wonders that surround us. The wonder of God's creation. The wonder of love, of loved ones. The wonder of breathing in and out. The wonder of life. G.K. Chesterton put it this way, The world shall perish not for lack of wonders, but for lack of wonder. The world will perish when we no longer wonder. Today's reading from James, uh, it's a message that we need to hear today. And the first part of James's message is this. It's there to remind the readers, the listeners, the hearers, that every gift, as James puts it, every perfect gift, all good things come from God. We have done nothing to deserve God's gifts. All we simply must do is receive them. Now, there are some of us who have trouble receiving gifts. And let me ask you something. Usually, what's the first thing you do when someone has given you something? You say, unless you were raised by wolves, you say, thank you. One of the first items, one of the first steps in socialization that we teach our children is to learn to say thank you. It's courteous. It's, ex- it's an expected response. Worship is our time to pay attention. It's our time to take note of the graced presence of God in our lives and to say thank you to God. Just showing up to worship and saying thank you? Well, the writer of James says that that's not enough. If we really want to pay attention to the gifts that God has given us, if we really want to worship and praise and thank God, well, we also need to act upon that thanks. I mean, that's what James, in this lesson, that's one of the things James is asking us to do. If we're going to receive God's salvation, if we're going to receive God's forgiveness, if we are going to be more than just hearers, James says, you can't just be a hearer, you got to be a doer. you got to act. And one way that you can give thanks to God and praise God is how you act. And James even starts the lesson, the list for us, of ways that we can, in thanksgiving to God, in praise to God, how we in our lives can reflect our thankfulness to God. You know, he says, Bridle your tongue. Well, what my grandma used to say is, watch your mouth. James says, to reflect the thankfulness, to live the the thankfulness of God in the world, watch your mouth. Watch what you say. Take a breath before you press send. Don't let the first thing that pops into your head pop out of your mouth. Don't speak out in anger. Choose your words slowly, carefully. James is, in a sense, saying, be your own first and best editor. So being a doer involves more, though, than just watching your mouth. James gives us a second one. James says, watch out for others. And he gives us an example from the time. Watch out for those who are fragile. Watch out for those who are helpless. And James cites the Old Testament when he says, care for orphans and widows in their distress. During biblical times, the orphans and the widows had no head of the household to protect them. They were not socially recognized. Their employment was unlikely. They usually lived in poverty and in homelessness. And so James is saying, if you want to say thank you, if you want to act out your thanks to God, then you need to look to the fragile and to the unprotected. You need to look and help those who are vulnerable, 
who are living in the midst and yet still on the fringe. And James would say, you have a responsibility to them. If you want to be a doer, if you want to reflect God's gifts of thank, if you want to be thankful to God, then be a doer. Not only watch what you say, but look at what you do for those who are on the fringe. Those who, are, who need to be, uh, you to be their ally to protect them. The last word that he would say is that we are to engage in actions and activities that demonstrate to the world the abundance of what God has given us. That we are to be doers. But I'll tell you something. Lutherans, and, and you know, those of you who perhaps don't know, uh, Holy Trinity Lutheran Church is a member of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And um, we have been dubbed in our history that we were kind of sit and soak during worship. That Lutherans like to sit and soak during worship. The Reformed Protestant group of which Lutherans are a member. And the observation there was that these sit and soak uh, members of the church, that they were almost glued to their pews. And they would let the words from the service, the words and the music from the musicians and the choir, they, and, and the message from the pulpit, they would simply let that wash down and over them, but they would not move. But there were Pentecostal worship persons who well, they engaged in body, mind, and spirit. They would step up out of the pews, and they would stand and shout and sing in their praise of God. The Roman Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox, and the Anglicans, they still have a tradition of what we jokingly say, smells and bells and chants, where they are getting up, where there is incense, where they are involving more of the whole person in their worship. In the Jewish synagogue, the Torah is read in its entirety through the year. And on the day that marks the final reading of that year, it's called Shemat Torah, the whole congregation rejoices that they have, and they are celebrating that the word of God through the year has been proclaimed. And the synagogues are filled with music and dancing. In fact, the ark that houses the covenant, all of the scrolls of the covenant, all of the scrolls of the word of God, they are brought out into the congregation and they are lifted and the congregation, the members of the synagogue dance and shout and sing and cry and weep all because of the word of God and how they have heard it, studied it, heard it proclaimed and studied through the year. They give thanks for that. It involves literally all of them as a person. I don't know what would happen if I did that at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. I don't know. But I love the thought that we use our whole minds and bodies and souls and spirit to give thanks, to live our praise to God. You know, in this day of, of voicemail, in this day of texts and, and our app-loaded phones, you know what, though? We still need physical signs to snap our attention back to what's most important in our lives. Our lives are, well, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to end this time together with a question. And here is my question. What spills from your heart? I've got a bucket here. A bucket filled with plastic balls. And, and I want you to see this bucket because they represent, for, the, the, for this illustration, this bucket represents you. And these are all the gifts that God has given you. Now you'll notice that when I take this bucket, as soon as I move it, some of the gifts spill out because every time we're bumped in life, something spills out. Every time we're jostled in life, some part of our core being spills out into the world. So the question I ask us is, what are we filled with? We are filled, Scripture says, James says it, we're filled with the gifts of God. And God has given every single one of us gifts. And when we're bumped, when we experience tragedy, pain, sorrow, 
when we experience joy and celebration. Each of those times were bumped. And something from our bucket spills out. The question I want us to wrestle with this morning is what spills out. Is it anger? Is it envy? Is it pride? Is it fear? Or is it love? Is it forgiveness? Is it healing? James says, we're filled every single moment with God's gifts, wonderful gifts, gifts to be shared. And as we go through our lives with our bucket, what do people experience? May they experience when they bump into us and we bump into them. And when we bump into the, the joys, the trials, the struggles of life, may, may what comes out of our bucket be love, gratitude, hope, peace, forgiveness. All of these are important. All of these are needed. Amen.